Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. America, our country, was founded largely on the concept of freedom. And freedom remains a hallmark and cherished treasure of our country even today. Just prior to the start of the Revolutionary War in 1775, Patrick Henry gave a very famous speech to the Second Virginia Convention in Richmond. And his speech ended this way. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Shortly after this speech, war broke out around Boston with the battles of Lexington and Concord. and The Revolutionary War waged on for eight years. In 1776, keeping with this theme of freedom and liberty, Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence, in which he wrote these famous words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, after the colonies were victorious in their war for independence, they went about the, the process of creating a, a government. And so they, the founders penned the Constitution and then the Bill of Rights. And in the First Amendment to the Constitution, the first of those Bill of Rights, we see the theme of freedom and liberty once again. Where the First Amendment <laughs> outlines that in our country we have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of the right of the people to assemble peaceably and to petition our government for redress of grievances. So you can see freedom was at the front and center of what our nation's founding was all about. Freedom from Great Britain, freedom from the oppressive rule of the king, economic freedom, religious freedom, freedom in general. And so we give thanks to our founders, to men like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson, and for all those men and women who have fought and died over the 200 plus years since to preserve those freedoms and liberties that we enjoy today, including the freedom to worship in this church today. Well, today we celebrate another kind of freedom, a freedom that perhaps is even more important than the ones I just outlined. And that is spiritual freedom. Or the freedom to have a clear conscience before God. For you see, today we celebrate the Reformation. The Lutheran Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, which was a revolution in its own right. We remember that on October 31st, 1517, 501 years ago, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany, setting in motion a series of events that led to the reformation of the Christian Church. Now, like our own American Revolution, the the Reformation was multifaceted. It involved many different issues, but at the center of it was this idea of freedom. How can we be free before God? How can we be freed from our bondage 
to sin, death, and the devil and freed to live in the joy and presence of God forever. Or to put it another way, how can sinful man, how can sinful men and women be made right or justified before a holy, perfect, and sinless God? That's what the Reformation was all about. For you see, at the time of Martin Luther and the other reformers, the church of his day taught that a person is made right with God by a combination of sorts of God's work for man coupled with man's work for God. There was a cooperation of sorts that took place. Now, Jesus did the hard part. Jesus came to die for our sins. Jesus came to make heaven possible for us. Jesus came to open the gates of heaven, so to speak. Without Jesus, there would be no hope, the church taught, but there was still a part for you to do. You had to do something to make heaven your own. Your works would cooperate with God's to merit for you eternal life. Now, the way this got fleshed out is what led Luther to pen and nail those 95 theses. You recall it had to do with something called indulgences, the sale of indulgences. For you see, the church taught that when a person sins, he or she incurs a debt or a penalty of some sort before God. And in order to enter heaven, your debts, your penalties, your punishment for those sins had to be paid off. Now the good news is because Jesus died for you, you won't go to hell for your sins. But nonetheless, you must still in some way work off your debt to God. Now, how would you do that? Well, you would do it through your works. You would sin, the church would give you something to do. So many prayers, or a pilgrimage to a holy site, or a good work for a neighbor. But what happens if your debts would outweigh your good works? Well, that's where the idea of purgatory came into to be where if you didn't pay off all your debt to God when you died, you would go to a place called purgatory. It's kind of a, a, a halfway house of sorts between earth and heaven. It wasn't hell, but nonetheless it wasn't a very pleasant place. For in purgatory you would be purged of your remaining sin. You would finish paying off the debt you owe to God. Well, this wasn't all that attractive to people. Imagine living your whole life trying to do your very best only to find out that when you die, you're going to have to spend years and years, hundreds of years perhaps, in this place called purgatory, waiting to finish paying off your debt so you can enter heaven. And so then this came, this is where the idea of indulgences came into play. The church taught that you could obtain an indulgence a means by which you could remove part or even all of the debt you owed to God. And by so doing, you would enter heaven faster or immediately. And what's more, these indulgences could be obtained not only for yourself, but also for a loved one, for anyone, any Christian, even those who are already in purgatory. And then this led to the idea that you could purchase these indulgences from the church. The church would sell them, so to speak, and by buying one of these indulgences, you could help yourself or someone get into heaven. This is what led Luther to write those 95 theses. The idea that somehow by your works, and especially with money, you could buy forgiveness of sins, and entrance into heaven. 
And this bothered Luther for a number of reasons. One, as he came to understand the scriptures, he saw that, no, it's not by what you do, it's by what, it's by what God has done for you in Christ that you have forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Two, if you have to do something to merit eternal life, then you rob God of the glory that is only his. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. He is the world's only Savior. But if you have to do something to enter heaven, then you, in effect, become your Savior. Yes, Jesus has done your part, but you must do yours, and so therefore you, in the end, are your Savior. And third, and this was perhaps the most personal part for Luther, he came to realize in his own spiritual struggles that if you must do something to merit forgiveness, life, and salvation before God, then you can never be certain of it. For how could you ever know when you have done enough? How can you ever know when your debt has been satisfied? For while you're striving hard to pay off your debt, we continue to rack up more. For we sin daily and deserve nothing but God's punishment. We're like a hamster. You know a hamster in a, in a little um, cage? And they have the wheel, and they run and run and run and run, and all go in circles? Well, that's how the Christian would be if it was based on our works. In fact, it'd be worse than that. We'd be running and running, and not just going in circles, we'd be going backwards. We would remain in bondage to sin, death, and the devil with no way to free ourselves from it if it was dependent on us and on our works. And so Luther and the Reformers came to understand as they studied the Scriptures that it is not because of what you do that you have eternal life, but it is because of what Jesus has done for you. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Or as St. Paul writes in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Or as we heard in our epistle reading for today from Romans, St. Paul writes, there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, And yet they are also justified, declared righteous by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, through the words of Scripture alone because it is the words of scriptures is the word of jesus that the holy spirit uses to create faith in us faith which simply receives these gifts of god and makes them our own it is his word which sets us free sets us free from our bondage to sin death and the devil and frees us to now go and love and serve our neighbor to do good works, yes, but not because we are trying to earn something from God, not because we are trying to make ourselves a child of God, but we do good works because that is who God has made us to be in His Son, Jesus Christ. As Paul says, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So on this Reformation Day, we give thanks to God for our freedom. We give thanks to God for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans. And we give thanks to Him most especially for the freedom that we enjoy in His Son, Jesus Christ. For as Jesus says in our Gospel for today, if you abide in My Word, you are truly My disciples and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free.
Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.